Good morning, good morning everyone. Thank you for that. I've got what you might call certainly the most nerve-wracking, if not dubious honor of starting us off this morning. But hopefully I've got some interesting things, at least lots of pictures to show you. The, the plan here, firstly, is to say who on earth is, it, is this guy? So this guy is a person who's just sort of, um, most of my life I've been involved in robotics and working on motion control and things like that uh, because I am a child of the Star Wars generation. So obviously once I saw R2-D2 at the age of about seven or eight, I was absolutely certain that that was what I was going to have to make. And uh, so I've been in the sort of world of writing software for manufacturing for about 25 years. And in that, that time, as you can imagine, we have seen massive, massive change in the technology that's available. And not just at the high end of you know, SpaceX and all that stuff, but right down here at this end where everyone has got access now to technology for making stuff which we could only have dreamed of when I was uh, a kid back then. Um, if you wander over to our stand over there, you see I, I am one of those rare people that literally builds robots with freaking lasers in their heads, which is amazing, right? So what I'd like to do is uh, introduce my company that I'm here to represent, but also talk to you a little bit about the history, because I think it's genuinely interesting because it reflects so much that happened in the maker community. So the company I, I, I'm uh, lucky enough now to, to head up is Vectric, and we write the computer-aided design and manufacturing software specifically really aimed at um, consumer users, you know, so people uh, who are not necessarily engineers or professionals, but people who are creative designers. It's a local company. We're only about 30 minutes from here. And um, an important thing about it, I always think to say, is it's employee-owned as well. So everyone that you meet in, a, in our uh, stand wearing our blue tops, they're all make completely part and parcel of the company, and we distribute the profits to the staff. Um, and they are all into the technology that we are working with. So you can go and ask them about any of the things that you see here or any questions you might have about technology after the show. And, and I'm confident that every, everyone there has got lots of interesting and important things to, to pass on. Where did it all begin? Well, when I first started, I worked on industrial engraving into steel and uh, mold tools in particular. Uh, so they were making the constructional parts for things like uh, car parts, headlamps, things like that. But there was a small demand that customers wanted to put their own logos on the internal surface of something they were going to injection mold. So they wanted to cut into steel the Black & Decker logo for the new drill handle that they were going to mold. And back then, you needed to write very complicated mathematics, really, to define the shapes. So you would get given the Black & Decker logo, and people had to go away and build what they called solids and surfaces to batch that. And this was very laborious, right? So the company set us the task, me and a small team, just two or three of us at that time, to try and come up with a better way to take a company logo into a toolpath that could be put on si inside of an industrial steel mold. And that's really what we started with. And we, we succeeded in doing that. But along the way, we realized we'd done something a little bit unexpected. So we thought, and we'd been tasked with setting out to make some artistic software for engineers to use to do their engineering processes. But in practice, it turned out more and more we were discovering that artists were discovering that they could do engineering with the software that we designed because it was built around the concepts of drawing and um, the things that were more associated with Illustrator than an engineering cab package. Uh, this was really accessible to people who were creative designers as opposed to engineers. And that really spun the whole business off. So we, start, we realized we'd found this niche, and so Vectric set up. And our primary, I could summarize pretty much what we do as being able to take a picture and make a physical object really, really fast. So in under 10 seconds, anyone on our stand will demonstrate you. We can take a picture and make a 3D carving from that picture in, a, in about 10 seconds or less. Uh, that turns out to be a very powerful, simple idea that can be used in many, many ways. So we've got people using it to do engraving still. So back in the kind of still doing those original ideas of engraving into metal for coinage and medals and dyes and buttons and all those sort of things. Sign making, jewelry manufacturing, uh, sorry, um, furniture and woodworking, as well as architectural kind of stuff. All of this really is, is what you might imagine the creative and artistic side of computer-aided design and manufacturing. And previously, it was very difficult for people with a creative flair to access that tech. Uh, the company was founded in 2005, and we launched our first product in 2005. So it's quite an old company now, I guess, by modern standards. But it turned out 2005 was a magical year, if you're in the maker world. 
it, it, if you're trying to remember 2005, because it seems like a hell of a long time ago, it was when Peter Kay was trying to find his way to Amarillo. So that gives you a bit of a feel. But more importantly, from our perspective as, uh, as makers, it's when in Italy they launched the Arduino. So I'm sure many of you will be aware of this. It was the first kind of open source microcontroller architecture aimed at hobbyists and uh, non kind of uh, industrial uses, uh, built around a set of open standards. And it launched a whole world, really, of consumer based and hobby based homebrew electronics and micro uh, electronics which it just happens, as we'll see, is a crucial part of making cheaper and cheaper CNC machines and, and other types of technology for making. A company called RepRap as well, many of you will, be, will have heard of this, I'm sure, it certainly made all the national news at the time, but uh, out of Cambridge, uh, no, sorry, Bath University, um, the guys put together a, a kind of package of open source designs for the first consumer level 3D printer. So 3D printing was, had been around for a bit, and in my early days, I was involved in some 3D printing work, but the machines cost tens of thousands of pounds. They used exotic materials, and they were really, um, should we say, temperamental. They required an awful lot of maintenance. So RepRap was about building something where you could build your own parts, you could replace the parts that got broken, uh, and again, they made it all open, and uh, that really kick-started, certainly in the UK, the 3D printer revolution. And it wasn't coincidental that Make Magazine, that some of you I'm sure are subscribers to, which kind of details all this stuff, also launched. So 2005 just turned out by chance for us to be a really amazing year. And so we launched this product which we expected to be used by industrial creative designers in those examples that I just gave you. But instead, we picked up all of these small machines and people working, building their own machines to make all sorts of objects in the hobby space. Everything from mechanical devices like the clock you can see here, musical instruments, even up to full-size uh, boats. Um, in fact, boat building has turned out to be quite a big area where, where hobbyists still build their own machines and still do a lot of work um, in their garages. Gosh, so that was 19 years ago. Uh, so now here we are in 2024, and we time warp forward. These, incidentally, are also all versions of the TARDIS that I was able to find last night that have been made with CNC in our software. The one on the left is a, or the one on this side is, the, uh, is a money box, all the way up to a full-size version that somebody built in their yard in the US uh, that you can go inside, and it's fully functional. Well, not fully functional, you know what I mean. So what's allowing this to happen is that there's loads of these machines around now, and they're all relatively inexpensive. If you go on the internet now, you'll find something from like a couple of hundred pounds and up. That's what we're talking about. Obviously, what you get for a couple of hundred pounds is limited starter, but there's, you can build and build from there. But you've got a lot of options now as makers in 2024. There's varieties of 3D printer, there's lots of laser cutting technology, and there's these CNC routers. So what I thought we'd do is we will have a little walk amongst these things and, and see what the pros and cons are of each type of technology. And I will try and give you a very honest view about it, explain where we fit into the puzzle. Um, but, but mostly, I want to give you the sort of strengths and weaknesses of each type of maker tech so that you can start to think about how it might fit into your own hobby space. So the first of these, which I, I guess, by, given all the hype that occurred in the last 19 years, most of you will be aware of, which is, is the old 3D printer that's what I think of as an extruder. So it kind of squeezes out plastic like a toothpaste tube and builds up in layers the object that you're trying to build. The example I've got here is the one I have at home. It's a Prusser 3D printer, and it takes the plastic in the top, melts the plastic, squeezes it out, and moves around to, to, to build up the layers that, that create the shape. It's really simple to use because, generally speaking now, things have got a lot easier in terms of robustness of dealing with the data. Uh, it's kind of mature technology, although it seems still, sometimes it, it surprised me, but like I said, about 20 years they've been around. Uh, and the results in those hard plastics, ABS plastics and things, are very robust. And you can buy plastics now that work with these extruders, which will be more or different properties. So you get some that will give you rubbery effects for tires. You can get some that glow in the dark. All these sort of materials are available now for you to vary your printing with. But fundamentally, they're all kind of plastics, which is beginning to be something we're beginning to get more and more concerned about, right? Usually, these printers are also will make relatively small objects. We're talking about objects that are kind of things that you can just hold in your hand. Um, it's not strictly true. There are some massive ones, but they're very edge case and kind of just proofs of concepts, really. So we're talking about small components. It's built in layers, and sometimes you can see those layers, uh, but fundamentally always a form of plastic. Um, the new wave of 3D printers that's come around in the last five years is what we might call 
it's often known as SLA, but I think of it as, as resin curers, okay? So these are printers. Instead of layering stuff down from a tube, they start with a bath of resin that's a liquid but turns solid under ultraviolet light. So you can have a, a screen which shows a flash of ultraviolet light, and above that screen, it will solidify the resin. And then you can move a layer up, solidify the resin, layer up, solidify the resin, and gradually build these things. It's quite amazing. If you've not seen one, and there's, I've seen at least three on my way in this morning, it's worth going to have a look because it's like a miraculous, you know, Lady of the Lake at Excalibur moment. This thing rises out of the liquid, and it's really something to watch, especially on the speeded up camera. But they're, they're quite fast because they do a layer at a time rather than having to squeeze out every path. They produce now much better detail. You really will struggle to see the layering in a good one of these. And the results have got better. In the early days, it was a very brittle uh, result because the resins had to be kind of quite exotic materials. But now they've got resins which are more or less plasticky. They're more robust. You can drop them and they survive. They can take paints better. Um, and you can get a little bit like the, AB, the uh, plastics world. You're starting to get resins with different properties that you can choose from. The cons are that it sometimes feels like you're in a chemistry shop because these resins, they're nasty when they're in liquid form. So you've got to take care with them. You can't dispose of them trivially. You mustn't get them on your skin. They're a, they are toxic and they are an irritant. Um, and so this is a bit of an issue. S similar to the um, plastic printers as well, you're generally limited to a, a small size object that's kind of hand uh, handheld object. I found this picture, I was quite pleased with this because Colin Furs is following me uh, after this. And I'm pretty sure this is a picture of him when he was a kid. Certainly looks like it to me. So that's 3D printers. The other thing that you're going to see around here is lasers and laser cutters. And again, there's two types of these, prime basically. Ones which use a, um, a carbon dioxide glass tube to create the laser, to excite the molecules that create the laser beam. Right. So it's a kind of very delicate glass object. These things tend to be bench size, uh, but they're very powerful. So they are typically, they're going to give you over 60 watts of power, which means it will cut through most wood up to you know, 10, 15 millimeters, no problem, acrylics, all those sort of things. They've become quite cheap. Um, they're quite bulky, uh, but they are generally fully contained. So they have, you, know, you can have extractor fans on them, and you can kind of protect your eyes from the dangerous light from the lasers. Um, they burn very fine lines. So they can give you very high detailed markings and etchings. But the, the cons of lasers are interesting, right? Because this is the first time in my world of making, cutting and building and creating machines where the color of the material really matters. I mean, normally you wouldn't care, would you? But it turns out with lasers, because they're using the absorption of the laser light, the color of your material will more or less reflect some of that laser light. So it turns out they can be very sensitive to what color of material you're cutting. Um, and you can't control how deep you cut very easily. You're just going to blast it with a laser beam and it will ablate away some of the material and make a pit which is more or less of a consistent depth. But what you can't easily do is, is cut very reliably to a fixed depth and have a smooth finish. And that can be a problem depending on what you're trying to achieve. Relatively small bench, you know, like I said, they're bench size. So you can imagine the objects you're going to make, you're going to be able to cut with this. It's maybe A2, if you think about an A3 piece of paper, about twice that. And uh, they're delicate. You need to align those mirrors. If you bash them or smash them, then they've got a big glass tube in them. They're also firing that laser beam round uh, a series of aligned mirrors, which you have to keep aligned and make sure they stay aligned. And they get covered in smoke over time, and you have to clean them. So there's a bit of regular maintenance. And you've got to deal with fumes, which is a real problem with, uh, with laser cutters. And that's led to the next, the next new wave that we're getting in the, in, the, in the last five or six years, which is to take what we call solid state lasers or laser diodes. So to you and me, these are basically LEDs that are powerful enough that they can produce a laser light. And that is a real game changer. And I think we're seeing dramatic changes here. And this is the bit that I'm particularly interested in right now. They're really simple to fit because the whole thing fits inside a unit on its own. And it just needs electricity into it. And the whole thing's self-contained. There's no bouncing mirrors, no glass components. It's like a big LED. Relatively inexpensive. We're talking about under maybe about 500 pounds will get you a very, very powerful one. And uh, so it depends on my definition of inexpensive, right? But in the realms these days of, a, of only about 10 pints of lager, it seems. So uh, you can fit these, because they're self-contained, right? You can fit them on an existing machine. So that is another massive benefit. And over on uh, our stand and some other stands, you'll see that we've got machines that can do all the movements. So you can just attach it to that. And you've got all the movement in place. And now you've got a laser cutter to add to your uh, collection of things that you can use. The power. 
at the moment, the most I've ever seen is claimed is 45 watts. And even that, I don't know, I haven't, I haven't used one of those. I would say it's much more typical that you're going to see one two to six watts. And that means it's good at marking surfaces. With a lot of passes, it will cut some thinner material. But basically, you're going to be using it for etching and marking rather than cutting through. But that's, crucial. that's good, right? Because if you put it on a machine that's good at cutting, you've got the perfect partners. Um, because they're not self-contained, make sure you're wearing goggles, and you've still got to worry about fumes. All right, so that's your lasers and printers. Now, like, like I said in the beginning of this, I think we're all beginning to start worrying about some of these materials. We're starting to worry about plastics. We're starting to think about things that we could reuse rather than buying new stuff and generating more and more waste. Um, so what can we do with upcycling and recycling? Maybe you need metal, right? They're just You can't get away from the fact that some objects just need to be made out of metals, either because they've got to be conductive or just simply strong enough. Aluminium or, or uh, brass or bronze parts. Maybe you want to just use an actual pure natural material, like, a, like a, a piece of beautiful wood. And maybe you want to just work on stuff that's really big. And like I said, the problem with some of the technologies we've just looked at is they are generally going to be limited to just things you can hold in your hand. If you want to build furniture or big objects, you'll see around that the guys, some guys have got the biggest 3D printers you can get. And they can build some quite big objects, but with a lot of printing that they then have to bolt together. Um, this one is a bit controversial, I guess. But I would say I've had my, my uh, Prusa 3D printer now for two years. And I've, I've never produced anything that my wife would honestly say was beautiful off it. I mean, lot, it's in the eye of the beholder, right? But I can take a piece of scrap wood, I can skim it back, and I can carve a small uh, decorative box into it. And the thing that I've literally picked up at our local tip becomes a really beautiful object. Once you put a layer of varnish over it, it's amazing. So I, I do think. We have to accept some of these things. They're not beautiful. They're functional. And even um, I've noticed a lot now, there's a big thing for kits that are laser cut out of um, MDF and plywood. And I don't know about you guys. We've got, our eyes have got kind of used to the fact that everything's burnt, isn't it? You've got burnt edges. And even with air assist, you're going to get some burning on the surface. And we kind of accept it because it is really convenient. But you, you don't have to do that. You, know, you, you can do some other things with a, with a CNC machine that don't involve burning. So let's take a look at this old, the, the final contender. And I think it's interesting because it's kind of come full circle. This was the thing that has been around since the 50s. It's gone through this whole revolution. It's been sort of potentially overtaken and superseded by these other types of making technology. But now I think the time has come to look at it again because it really is coming into its own. I've picked this one as well, by the way, because this is sort of strangely, this is a CNC machine made of, a la of laser cut parts. So they use the laser to make the CNC machine. It's obviously pretty simple, right? It is just a thing with a router on it that you can move under computer control. And the technology involved in all of that these days is really well understood. You get them in any size. You can get them to suit any sort of size of wallet as well, or purse. It is more complicated to learn. I'm not going to deny that. And we'll talk about some of those in a second. Um, and you've, some of the detail that you're going to get out of it is going to be determined not by the machine itself, but by the tools, the cutting tools that you use in it. And it can be dusty and noisy. And so generally speaking, you would want to put it in some sort of enclosure, generally, or you're going to have to have it outside in the garage. Um, but that said, the noise, a lot of that noise comes from the router that you put on it. And so if you go buy a slightly more expensive machine that comes with a true spindle on it, uh, which is kind of the next tier up, that makes a huge difference. And they are much, much quieter, in fact. And as we've mentioned, with a solid state laser, just as in this example, this is the Onefinity machine we've got on the far side of our stand with a magnetic attached laser head on it, which literally just snaps into place. It's superb. You can have the best, best of both worlds. So your machine can both carve and etch and, uh, and mark with the laser. As I've said before, lasers are poor at cutting to fixed depths. So they're very bad at pockets. They're not terribly good at grooves of known depths. And they're not very good at accurate slots. They're not very good at removing a lot of material. But, but wood routers are fantastic with all those things. So you can combine the two and have the best of both worlds. Obviously, you've got to wear goggles again because it's not inside a laser-proof enclosure. And I would emphasize at the end, you've got to take, I mean, you should always be paying attention to fire safety, right, in any workshop. But if you're going to mix wood chips and a laser, then you've definitely got to take a lot of attention to fire safety. That said, we do it a lot, and it is perfectly doable. So let's, I'm going to guess what five things are the big things that everyone's thinking about if they want to think about this. Realistically, you want to know how difficult it is. Can I actually achieve things in this? Or is it just one of those other magical technologies where I watch a guy on YouTube, and then I think, how on earth did he manage that or she managed that? 
What tools am I going to need to get started? How big can stuff be? We've talked about that a little bit, that things can be big. What materials can we use? And, and crucially, how much will it cost? Well, how difficult it is, I love this quote. This is a quote that you kind of hear paraphrased in lots of cases, right? The thing about a CNC machine is it's basically very simple. You take a block of material and you remove all the bits that don't look like the thing you're trying to make. That's it, right? It's as simple as that. So it turns out, of course, that's a very hard way to think about some shapes. And that's where our software comes in. Because you want to design the shape you want and let us worry about how we turn that into the thing that removes the stuff you don't want to leave your shape behind. And that's kind of what we call toolpath strategies in our software. The other thing, the strength and arguably the weakness, I guess, of this is because you can cut almost anything with almost anything, you're going to have to learn about how those things behave and react and which things work and which things don't work in certain material types. So it's almost like the breadth of possibility is also something that you have to accept is going to be a learning curve because you, every time you try a new material, you're going to have to explore it and see how it behaves under a cutter. But generally speaking, most people work in two or three materials very frequently, and then some edge case things later on, which we'll show you some examples of. So I think you can get up and running pretty quickly. And again, the software can really help, because it will give you all presets that people before you have all had to worry about and sort out what they need to do. And the software, well, the software will determine the workflow and how easy it is to make that step. So when you think about software, I would suggest to you, and I'm, obviously I'm, I do some software, but we're not the only software here. So I do encourage you to go and have a look. But in your mind, I would suggest just think about how quickly and easily does this make me get from the thing I'm imagining to actually holding it in my hand. That's fundamentally what we're here to try and achieve. And I would like to offer a couple of other things, right? So one thing we're always tempted to do when we first look at technology is to buy, you know, we, get, we upsell ourselves. And I would say just caution everyone that there is a cost to that, as this TV controller shows, that actually having all those options sometimes diminishes your productivity. So just be a bit cautious about that. And I would suggest start simple. And then you, know, you can have a TV controller, which uh, has rendered up weirdly. But that's meant to be the Apple TV controller with just three buttons. Uh, and actually, I think you, know, you can always build up from there. So go with the simplest thing that actually delivers what you need. And, and tr don't be distracted by all the extras, the bells and whistles. Um, at the moment, there's a big sort of tension building, I think, between s computer software wanting to sell you as a subscription and, the, and what I think of as you know, the old school of you, just, you bought it and it's yours. Now, there seems to be a lot of things where you buy it, but it's not really yours. Uh, so I would just caution you about this. I'm not a total zealot about subscriptions. You know, I've got Netflix and everything like, like most of you, I'm sure. But what I would say is that that subscription works because the content I'm consuming, I didn't make. Somebody else has made a load of content, and I'm going to subscribe to access their stuff. What you're going to do in this world is make your designs. And you've got to just be careful. If you do go for a subscription, just make sure that you know how you're going to access your stuff if you change your, your software later on. Because I think it is a different proposition that people are making you. And you've got to think, is that really appropriate? So I would just think about, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying think about, what, what's my, ask the people, what happens if I want to change software later on? What happens if your company gets sold out? I like you guys, but what happens if next year you're all sell up and retire? What protects my ongoing subscription? What if I want to change my CNC machine later? And what if I don't like an update that you're, you're pushing, but I'm on subscription and I want to stay on the old one? Thank you very much. Just think about some of these things. We're in a, sometimes a production environment. We want to control when changes happen to our production environment and not have it just occur overnight unexpectedly. right? So quickly, how much do CNC machines cost? Well, like I said, 200 pounds right now on eBay. I think 139 pounds was the cheapest one I found last night on Amazon. Um, and that will get you a small machine, bed size like this, which will cut waxes and soft materials. So that's the sort of thing, if you're going to cast waxes, then you could, you could get something as, as cheaply as that. I would say more realistically, you want to spend about one and a half grand for a woodworking type machine of the sort that you can see on our stand over there. And we've got two or three varieties if you want to go and have a look, with, which we've selected because they have different properties. And we can talk to you about the pros and cons of each. But they're all in that 1,500 pound range. Above that, you can go all the way up 250. You're starting to buy a proper router, desktop size or large scale router, which will take whole sheets of uh, MDF and uh, plywood onto them. And 5,000 and all the way up, you can go commercial. How stuff can things be that I make? Well, that just depends on your machine. So if you buy the little one, you can make little stuff. One 1,500 pound stuff, 5,000 and up. And then, you know, 
things the size of a room. Uh, I have worked on a project before where they made full-size wind tunnel car chassis, you know, to test uh, car uh, designs that, that are the size of this entire, pretty, pretty much this row <laughs> of the audience. Uh, so the machines don't really care. They're just, you can build them any size. Smaller ones will allow you to make circuit boards and engraving, that sort of thing, which they're very good at. And again, if you've done this sort of circuit board stuff where you've used acid etching and things, it's a lot, it's a lot cleaner way of doing it. I mean, you can't quite get as fine details, but for very simple circuit boards, I still have a, rack, a stack of these little um, pre-made uh, copper-backed uh, blank circuit boards, and every now and then it's just so quick to throw that on and just carve out the toolpath I've made. I use the KiCad stuff, and you can get the files out of KiCad, and we can just create the toolpaths using the, uh, the KiCad file format outs of those. There's casting into precious metals or even cutting the precious metals directly. Furniture we've talked about. So once you get it to a 1500 power machine, you can start to make your own office furniture in funky inlays and patterns. You can make stuff uh, that keep the kids happy. So uh, this is one that one of our friends made for, for his grandson. This is made from polyurethane sign foam. So it's a really soft material that you can just uh, you can keep outside and things. So it's the same plastic they use in carrier bags and things. So I'm afraid we are back to plastics. But as you can see, the finishes are wonderful, and they can use those uh, as e external signs. And this was the basis of this model you can see, which one of our um, uh, customers, Jamie Oxenhole, made for a film set. So they had to make a full-size model for the back of a, an advertising uh, film set. Uh, and you can see here, that's actually it to scale with the other characters in the, in the drama. Uh, and that's just made on pieces. So they take them, build the model, they break it down into pieces, they cut the pieces on the machine, and then assemble it. And our, we did a similar thing to make our vector over there with a the light bulb on his head. So if you want to go and take a closer look at him, you can watch there's a video of how he was made going on on his, uh, his uh, chest screen as well. So you can see that. And these are some other examples of large format things. So um, if you've got a machine that's big enough, then you can cut things that are really large um, from kind of internal architectural stuff to actual buildings themselves. And the buildings is interesting. This is a great project that I always like to mention that one of our um, partners in, in, America, in the US got involved in. After there's been disasters and disaster relief, often you go to a kind of tent village, right? So they get tents out there very fast. But there's a phase when they've still lost a lot of uh, accommodation for people after disasters where they want to move away from tents, and particularly if the weather's changing. And this project came along where the idea is they can ship a container out there with a CNC machine and a stack of wood in it, but also they can supply from the local area, the main resources. But the thing is like a big jigsaw puzzle. So you throw the wood onto the machine, it cuts the parts out, it labels them all, and then they can assemble more semi sort of permanent um, accommodation using the local materials because the, the router at the end of the day will cut anything. So this has been a great product pro project. We've been involved in it. We provide all the files for free. And they did disaster relief in various places um, in Haiti and other places hit particularly by natural disasters. And as you can see, it keeps people off the ground. It's properly, they can insulate those panels properly in the winter periods. So it's a much, much more um, promising solution, I think, in that intermediate period between tents and getting build buildings replaced. More sort of frivolous, but just as interesting, I think, in its own way. This is uh, Rob Bell at the Burning Man Festival. And he builds these interesting geomes. And again, he builds them all from uh, panels and connector parts that he makes on a relatively small um, CNC machine that's just in his garage. So that's it. So we talk about how big things can be. The answer is very big. What materials can I use? Well, at the beginning of this, those who were paying attention will know that an important thing for me is you can use all the materials you require to build your own R2-D2. That's a very important thing. And so um, we've been a sort of <laughs> involved for a long time with lots of members of the old uh, Astromex and R2-D2 club. And as you can see there, there are parts made from all sorts of different materials. And a router is brilliant because it will do all those different materials, just depending on the tooling. We can make waxes for lost wax casting, as I mentioned. So this is an example made by one of my colleagues for his daughter of a, a Celtic pendant. But crucially, because it's a CNC machine, you can use the same machine also to cut the wood with similar motifs to make the gift box in which you can present your piece of jewelry. Now, this is a full-size hockey player up here uh, and some signage. Does anyone see what this is made of? Anyone guess what that's made of? Ice, right? It's made of ice. And uh, the sky's the limit, right? So if you get a machine that will run in sub-zero temperatures, as this bulldog does on the, on the left, then all those celebrity parties and external events and the ice hotel in um, 
Scandinavia, the several ice hotels in Scandinavia. Again, they're using CNC machines to make these projects. And as you can see, all the way up to a full-size car. This is a Philadelphia uh, company that we work with. Um, amazing. I'm going to finish on this one with the materials, exotic materials, because I like this one particularly. This is a company in uh, Pit Lockery in Scotland, and they came up with this fabulous idea. This is them outside their building uh, in, the, in just the heather area, just not far from their car park at the office, collecting heather. And they take the heather, and they saw it up into uh, uh, smaller chunks. They dye it, and then they compress it in industrial press under several tons of pressure. And that results in all of the material in the wood getting squeezed out to make a kind of resin block. Then they can carve the resin using a conventional CNC machine into beautiful shapes which they can polish and make as the centerpieces of their jewelry. So I like this because when I say what materials can you use, to some extent you can invent a new material that nobody's even thought of. What a genius idea. And um, yeah, the sky's the limit. It's just a cutting machine. So it'll cut whatever you can think of to make it cut. OK, so in summary then. That's all they are. CNC machines, there's loads around. You're going to see them everywhere. They're just cutting machines. Um, they're really the most flexible thing you can put in your workshop. They come in all shapes and sizes, and they come uh, to suit any pocket. Uh, and they'll cut on almost any material. You've just got to choose the machine appropriately for the material you want to cut. Everything from free cutting brass and, and aluminium all the way to soft things like wax. The machine doesn't care as long as it's an appropriate kind of mechanically capable device. Um, the software you choose, be careful about the software you choose. It's going to really determine your productivity. And I hope some of you will come over and have a chat to us. Thank you very much for your attention. I really appreciated it.